Hello folks, it's Professor Fiore back one more time. In this video, we're going to look at the low frequency response of a single stage JFET amplifier, specifically a common source amplifier. So let's get to it. Here's our amplifier. I have a small signal FET here at 2N5458. There are three capacitors of interest, the input, the output, and the bypass position. These are going to create lead networks or low frequency limits. So first, let's take a look at the data that we need for our device. First thing at the top, threshold voltage. So this is your VGS off, negative 2.88 volts. Now, instead of uh, calling this GM0, they call it lambda, but that's 3.1686, roughly 3.17 millisiemens for lambda. Now, based on those values, you can immediately do a computation for IDSS, and you will get 4.56 milliamps. Now, this is a self-biased circuit. You can see that we just have a source resistor in here, and the uh, gate goes back to ground through a, a single resistor. There's no external power supply. So this would be a self-bias where VGS is the same as the drop across to RS. So we can use a self-bias graph on this. Uh, we would need GM0 RS. So you take your 2K times your GM0, that gives you 6.34. And from the graph, you get the ratio of ID to IDSS, which is approximately 0.18. Now, you multiply that up by your IDSS, and you find out you have a current that's a little over 8 tenths of a milliamp, and a GM of about 1.35 millisiemens, which we'll use in just a second to calculate the gain. But before I go any further, let's go double check the DC on this. So if we have about 0.8 mils, the first thing I'm going to say is we should get a little over 1.6 volts on RS, and uh, again, a little over 0.8 mils times 6K will give us a little over 4.8 volts here. From the 15 volt power supply, we should see not quite 10.2 volts at this drain. So let's verify that that all works. Get our little table over here. So let's go look at node three. And there's 1.612, so we were expecting about 1.6. And at node 7, there's 10.164. Again, we were expecting a little under 10.2. So, looking beautiful. All right. Now, this amplifier has a gain, an inverting gain, of GM times our load. So the R load is 6K in parallel 12K, or about 4K. The GM we precedingly calculated... Uh, at about 1.35 millisiemens. So you multiply those out, you get an inverted gain of almost 5.4, which is, in decibels, just a little over 14. Okay, so I would like to do a transient analysis on this just to make sure that we're getting a decent-looking waveform out of here. And as usual, I'll skip the first millisecond, set this up for a couple of cycles, and here we go. Let's get the uh, legend on here. So the green is the input. This is our 100 millivolt peak 1 kilohertz sine wave, looking good. And the maroon is the load, which again, we're expecting to get somewhere around 5.4 times this, or about 540-ish millivolts. Well, there's 500 millivolts right there. So we're just about there, maybe a little shy of 500 mil. Here we're a little bit over. Right, here's your 400, 500s right here. So we're getting a little bit of asymmetry. In other words, we're getting a little bit of distortion, which you know wouldn't be surprising for an amplifier like this. But in any case, we know that it's working the way we expect. Now we can turn our attention over to the frequency response. All right, so using these values, I've put in some rather large numbers, one microfarad for the input. 100 mics for the output, and 10 milli, or 10,000 micro, for the bypass. This is going to produce some very low critical frequencies, which we can check directly here with uh, our AC analysis. So I'm going to run this from a tenth of a hertz up to 100 kilohertz. 
And here we go. Notice down here, this is one hertz. So this thing is pretty much dead flat down to one hertz. Our three decibel down point, which is again, the half power minus three dB is half power. Uh, that would be down here somewhere, you know, a tiny fraction of a hertz. So let's just double check the gain on this. And we were expecting gain a little over 14 dB. And there we go, just a little over 14. All right. So, so far, uh, so a uh, good. Now, we're going to turn around and utilize our equation, right? The FC 1 over 2 pi RC on each of these networks in turn. So let's turn our attention to the input network. This is, in this case, probably the easiest one. The question is, what is the resistance that feeds C in? In other words, if I were to thevenize around C in, what do we see? Well, looking back this way, we're going to short the AC source. So I have 50 ohms. Looking this way, we see the 2 meg gate resistance, and that would be in parallel with the Z in gate. Now, the Z in gate is going to be huge, right? As a FET, we're talking many, many megs. So we can approximate this whole thing as just 2 meg, right? You got 2 meg in parallel with huge, which is 2 meg, and that's in series with 50, which is still 2 meg. All right, now, to push things in, we are going to uh, change this capacitor right, from the one mic to a thousand, one one thousand times uh, that value, right? So we're going to change this from microfarads to nanofarads. Now remember, the system was pretty much flat down to about a hertz. Now when we calculate this, one nanofarad and two megs, that's going to give us a break frequency of about 80 hertz, right? Plugging it in here, 1 over 2 pi R, 2 meg, C, 1 nano. So we should see a roll off at about 80 hertz. Let's see what we get. Okay, clearly we're not going down to 1 hertz anymore. Let's grab a cursor and see what we get. All right, so there's our 14-ish. We're just a little below 13.929. So we're looking for about 11, right? It's 14 minus 3 is about 11. And right around there. Okay. And we're looking at 79.7. If you went back, 180.9. But, you know, right around the 80 hertz that we expected. Beautiful. Okay. So let's go back. So that worked out really well. Let's turn this back into the original one microfarad and turn our attention over to the output network. So what do we have for this one? Again, we want to see the um, resistance, the Thevenin equivalent resistance around C out. Well, looking out this way, we've got the 12K for the load. Looking out this way, the power supply shorts, and we've got 6K, and then we've got the FET itself, but that's modeled as a current source, so that's a really huge value. Really huge in parallel with 6K is going to get a 6K. So we've got a 6K out there, and that's going to wind up being in series with 12, right? Just imagine you, know, you pull out the cap and you kind of mentally replace this with an ohmmeter, and you see the 12 going to ground and the 6 going to ground. So that's 18K. So I go into here, I throw an 18K for here, and then the capacitor value. And we're going to do the same kind of thing over here with C out. We are going to jump this by a factor of 1,000. So it's going to be 1 1,000th one the value. So we, we had 100 mics, so we're going to look at 100 nano now. So we're going to plug in 100 nanofarads and the 18K. And when we do that, we get just about 88 hertz. Okay, so let's do our analysis and see how well this comes up. All righty. Get our cursor out here. Do we have 14? Yes, we do. Drop three decibels from that. That'll be 11. And that's going to be right around there. Oh, looky, 89.98. So, like I said, we were looking for 88 and change. Looking pretty good. All right? Now what? Well, now for the last one. Which would be, and before I forget, let me return this guy to his original value of 100 mics. Now we have to look at the bypass network. Now, if you saw the video on 
the common emitter low frequency response, we have a similar sort of thing going on here. This is not a true lead network. In fact, uh, we have sort of a shelving response out of here. It'll roll off and then eventually it'll flatten out because, you know, in these two, C in and C out, as frequency goes down, X sub C just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and you get more and more and more and more loss. With the bypass network, as the frequency drops, this gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It's no longer shorting out RS, but it can't produce a value any bigger than RS. So when C bypass equals RS, when this X sub C is equal to this value, that's where it starts to flatten out again. So there's actually two frequencies of interest. We still calculate them using this formula though, all right? But what's the resistive value? You know, that secondary one, we would just find 2K and then whatever the cap is. And before I forget, let's go and change this. We're gonna crank this one way down from 10 milli to one micro. So the secondary, the flattening point, like I said, we'd plug in 2K and one micro, but where's the initial roll off? Well, again, we have to figure out what's the impedance seen by C bypass. Well, I would see this 2K and that would be in parallel with ever the uh, impedance is looking into the source of the FET. What is that? Well, if you've seen the videos on gain, you know that that would be one over GM. And we've calculated our GM is 1.35 millisiemens. So I'll take one over that, put that in parallel with the 2K. That's going to give us 541 ohms. So I'm going to plug in 541 ohms for this and one microfarad for this. And we are going to get a critical frequency of 294 hertz. Now I got to warn you, you know, that GM value that we're using is a bit of an approximation. You know, we read a value off of the self-bias curve and you know, some things like this. So is it going to be perfect? No, we might be a little bit off, but we're definitely going to be in the ballpark if everything is correct. Assuming I'm not lying to you. Let's see. All right, so there's that stepped response. And if you're wondering what this is, this is actually the roll off from the C and C out. If you crank these guys even bigger, like if you made this 10 mics and you made this 1,000 mics, this would actually be perfectly flat right out to the 100, um, 100 millihertz, all right? So I want to find the roll off here and here, right? This is our first and this is our second. So this one we said was going to be like 290 something. And uh, this one over here, um, works out to be around 80-ish hertz, right? So when I plug in the 2K and the one mic, we get somewhere around 80 hertz. Anyway, let's go check our levels. So do we have 14? Yes, we do. So now I'm going to be looking for 3 dB down, which is about 11. And where is my 11? That's around here. So I'm getting 258.6, nearly 260. So this is a little low compared to what we calculated. But like I said, you know, the GM isn't going to be perfect. Now let's continue along and see where the other point is. What I need to do is find this flattening. And then we'll work 3 dB up from that. So this is at just over 3 decibels as it is for the gain. So we go up 3, so that puts us a little over 6. All right, about 3.1 plus 3 is about 6.1. So what frequency does that work out to? Oh, a little too far. Oh, it's right around there. Uh, 86 hertz. Okay, and we were expecting about 80 hertz. Pretty good. All right. Okay, so we find that this is very similar to the common emitter uh, bipolar version. The inputs and outputs are done very much the same, except that this one actually is a little easier because you don't have to deal with a Z and base. You know, the Z and gate is virtually infinite, so you can just forget about that. Um, and the calculation over here um, for that first critical frequency on the, on the uh, bypass network is performed a little bit differently. Um, so here we just have one over GM, which is the ZN looking into the source. And the bipolar, you might remember, that was a function of R prime E and the resistance out in the base divided by beta. 
So R prime E was a very important factor there. All right. Ultimately, when we design circuits, we know what we want for the lower critical frequency, and we do this in reverse. In other words, we have the R values, we have known FCs, so we solve this equation in terms of C. In other words, looking at the output as an example, we would know we have 18K, and maybe I want a break frequency of, let's say, 20 hertz. So I'd plug in 20 hertz, and then I would solve for the value of C. Right? That would get me the desired value for C out. Of course, we would look for the nearest standard value that would be a little bit larger than that. By being a little larger, that would produce a critical frequency a little lower, right? So if I say I want to go down to at least 20 hertz, whatever that cap comes out to, let's say it works out to, you know, 43 microfarads, just to throw a number out, um, we would get the next higher standard value, which would be 47. So that would actually indicate a critical frequency slightly below the target. Don't forget, you also have tolerance on these things. So, you know, what's the worst case going to be? You would have to throw that in as well just to make sure that everything fell within your parameters. And you would not, finally, make all three of these critical at the same frequency. Because if you did, then you'd have loss from each one. And you wouldn't have a three decibel loss at the critical frequency. You would have three for this and three for this and three for this or minus nine. So typically we make one of them dominant. In other words, the, the highest one of the group. And in a FET, that would probably be this guy because the input impedance is so high, this would give you the smallest cap. So we'd make that one the, the determining factor. And then the C out and the C, C by, we would calculate using maybe a frequency 10 times lower than our actual target. So we get minimal effect from those. And there you have it. See you next time.